Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the phantom distinction between nuclear compellents and nuclear deterrence. This is covered in Chapter 2 of Bargaining Over the Bomb, The Successes and Failures of Nuclear Negotiations. And what a fantastic book it is. Go check it out. Anyway, let's spend a moment recapping nuclear compellents and nuclear deterrence. We say that successful nuclear compellence occurs if a nuclear-armed aggressor challenges a defender over some sort of status quo policy and forces the defender to back down. Whereas, if the aggressor did not have nuclear weapons, the defender would have stood firm. Thus, having nuclear weapons causes the defender to back down. Meanwhile, successful nuclear deterrence occurs if a nuclear-armed defender convinces the aggressor to just quit and not challenge the status quo. Whereas, if the defender did not have nuclear weapons, the aggressor would have chosen to challenge instead. A main takeaway from our earlier discussions of compellence and deterrence is that it is very difficult to use nuclear weapons to successfully compel an opposing state to give up something. It's difficult to credibly threaten an opposing country by saying, hey, if you don't give me this land that you currently control, I'm going to fire a nuclear weapon on you. In contrast, it is much easier to say to someone, If you try invading my capital, then I will fire a nuclear weapon against you. And thus, internalizing the threat, the aggressor chooses not to invade the capital at all, and deterrence is successful. What I want to do now is put a little bit more structure on what compellence and deterrence mean in the context of a bargaining game. What we're ultimately going to discover is that the distinction between the two is a bit of a phantom one. That is, if you have the ability to successfully deter your opponent with nuclear weapons, that allows you to make compellent threats that you would not otherwise be able to do. Put differently, deterrence implies compellence. To get that underway, I want to think about compellence and negotiations. And to begin that process... Let's imagine that a potential proliferator does not have nuclear weapons, and in fact, developing nuclear weapons isn't on anyone's radar. So we have an opponent and another state. Well, in negotiations over some sort of crisis, we would think about what the expected outcome of war would look like, again in the absence of nuclear weapons, and then base the settlement off what those expected outcomes would look like. So as diagrammed here, it looks like the opponent is going to prevail relatively more often than the potential proliferator would, and so the deal that needs to be struck in order to avoid war is going to give the opponent a lot of the good at stake, and a little bit, but not too much, for the potential proliferator. Now imagine what happens if you develop nuclear weapons, and we believe compellent theorists that those nuclear weapons are useful for direct offensive measures. Well, in that case, the potential proliferator, with now realized nuclear weapons, is going to be more likely to win the war. And so the expected outcome of war is going to shift in the potential proliferator's favor. Thus, if we are negotiating to avoid war in this post-shift world, the opponent cannot take as much of the policy good as it once did. It has to leave a lot more for the proliferator now that the proliferator has more realized power. Although not the focus of this lecture, it also means that if we were to be negotiating over nuclear weapons pre-shift, the opponent would have to base those concessions off of where that black line is. And moreover, if the opponent were to be thinking about preventive war instead, it would be thinking about the shift between those two, that gray line and that black line, and calculating how big of a shift it is versus how costly it would be to intervene with preventive war. Okay, now let's reset and throw everything out with compellents. So nuclear weapons are not useful for offensive purposes and cannot be used for any sort of compellent benefit. They're only useful for deterrence. Well, I want to focus on one of the words up here. We're thinking about the world of a pre-shift negotiations and the expected outcome of war that would happen if they were to fight 
again, before nuclear weapons have been developed. What does that mean, expected? Let's break that down a little bit. Imagine that there are three possible outcomes in the event of war. The potential proliferator wins, in which case the potential proliferator captures the entire good, leaving the opponents nothing. A stalemate occurs, in other words, the two armies fight for a while, realize that they can't make any real progress, and ultimately have to just divide the good in half. And then a third outcome is that the opponent wins, and therefore captures all of the good for itself, and the potential proliferator captures nothing. Obviously, this is a bit of a simplification. In the real world, there could be multiple different types of stalemates, and not all of those would grant half of the good to each of the parties. For example, it could be the case that the opponent fights a war and progresses pretty well at the beginning, but then stalls out later on, and the negotiated terms that would happen after that stalemate would give two-thirds to the opponent and only one-third to the potential proliferator. There are lots of different things that could happen, but we only need three to illustrate the main point of this lecture. Let's now assign some hypothetical probabilities to each of those possibilities. Imagine that one-sixth of the time, the potential proliferator would win, one-third of the time there would be a stalemate, and half of the time the opponent would win. Well, to calculate the expected border if they fought a war, we take each of those three outcomes and multiply them by their respective probabilities, and then add all of those values together. So, for example, if the potential proliferator wins, then the opponent receives nothing, and that occurs one-sixth of the time. So we have zero times one-sixth. Then in the event of stalemate, we have a division where the opponent is capturing half, and that's occurring one-third of the time. So we have one-half times one-third. And then finally, if the opponent wins, now it takes the entirety of the prize, all 100% of it, or one, and we multiply that by one-half. And if we take zero times one-sixth, add that to one-half times one-third, and add that to one times one-half, then we have two-thirds, and that is where I've drawn the border between the two. Now let's endow the potential proliferator with realized nuclear weapons. And again, taking compellence skeptics at their word, let's imagine that they're not useful for offensive military purposes at all. In other words, the distribution of those three outcomes, the proliferator winning, the stalemate, and the opponent winning, are identical. It's still one-sixth, one-third, one-half. Nothing has changed there. Deterrence does, however, alter what would happen in the event of the opponent winning. Imagine that the opponent destroys the potential proliferator's army on the battlefield. Well, without any other sort of consideration, the opponent could just march in its troops to the potential proliferator's capital and take over the entire territory. But with nuclear weapons, the proliferator can threaten nuclear retaliation. Internalizing that, the opponent must moderate its demands. In a world without nuclear weapons, it would have taken the entire thing. But now worried about all the damage that would be done to its own territory and its own capital and its own people through a nuclear assault, perhaps the opponent will only capture half of the good. I'm choosing half here because it makes the math a little bit easier. The key thing, though, is that instead of taking the entire good, the opponent will take something less. Here, one half. If we do that same calculation about what the expected outcome of war is, we still have zero times one-sixth and one-half times one-third. But now we have one-half times one-half instead of one-half times one. And if you multiply all those things together and then add them up, we have five-twelfths instead of two-thirds. So I've marked five-twelfths here on the screen as you see there. The key takeaway here, though, is that the deterrent nuclear outcome is exactly the same as the compellent nuclear outcome in terms of what the expected outcome of war is pre- and post-nuclear weapons. In turn, even if those nuclear weapons are only useful for deterrent purposes, you can compel the opposing side to give more to you in crisis negotiations.
nuclear weapons are essentially acting like an insurance policy here. You're no longer concerned about the worst case scenario, and as a result, you are more inclined to fight a war, and to convince you not to fight the war, your opponent has to give you more stuff in negotiations. Again, deterrence implies compellence. We can actually see this principle in action during the Yom Kippur War, which involved Egypt and Israel. In past conflicts between these two countries, Egypt's goal was to overtake everything, capture Israel. But during the Yom Kippur War, Egypt moderated those goals. Rather than try to get Israel, Egypt's goal was to take the Sinai Peninsula. That's that strip of territory that's lying between Egypt and Israel. What accounts for that difference? Well, between wars, Israel acquired a nuclear weapon. And Egypt was worried that if they went past the Sinai Peninsula and into Israel, that Israel would fire nuclear weapons at valuable Egyptian targets. And so rather than take an extra risk, Egypt moderated its target and tried to go for the Sinai Peninsula, wagering because the Sinai Peninsula was not an integral part of Israeli territory, Israel would not endure the backlash that might arise if it used nuclear weapons in response to the invasion of the Sinai. A final thing worth noting about this deterrent value is that the more often the opponent is winning, the more often nuclear weapons are useful in this context. That's because the insurance policy of nuclear weapons only pays out in the event of some sort of military defeat. So the more often you're defeated, the more often the insurance is useful to you. This helps make sense out of some recent trends in nuclear proliferation. If you think about countries like Iran, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and North Korea, each of those countries has a much more powerful opponent in mind as they're contemplating the development of nuclear weapons. If they're worried about, say, the United States coming in and invading and overthrowing those regimes, well, that could happen very often because the United States has a strong ability to project power and strong conventional military forces. But having nuclear weapons, again, acts as an insurance policy, thereby allowing each of those countries, if they were to acquire nuclear weapons, to obtain quite a bit more through negotiations, even though, once more, in this hypothetical world, we're only thinking about nuclear weapons as being useful for deterrent purposes. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.